Alright, today is Thursday, April 7th, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and let's not waste any more time. Here it is, in focus tonight. Let's do a brush on the wall of 40, and then the most stunning piece of macro data that we got today. Total media blackout, nobody's paying attention at all, but we're going to talk about it in this program. And lastly, stock pickers are losing? Really? Anyways, let's start with the wall of 40. And we have Russia, the brothel in DC, China, the thing, and the hawkish Fed, of course. Let's start by, um, let's do Russia. We got bad news today because Russia says that Ukraine presented unacceptable draft peace deal. Like, uh, you know, get out of our country and then we'll talk. So that's bad news. The bulls been buying the dip because we have a peace deal coming between Russia and Ukraine. Eh, wrong. What about China? What's going on with China and the brothel? We got a twofer for you here. Well, China warned of forceful measures if Nancy Pelosi visits Taiwan. And guess what? Immediately, Nancy Pelosi came out and said, <coughs> I got the, th the thing. Wink, wink. <coughs> and of course, we uh, hope for the best outcome here. What? I'm just hoping that she's gonna recover and make it out of this. What do you guys think I was hoping for her death? You dirty-minded so-and-so? What else? On the wall of worry. What about the hawk, the Fed? Well, we now know, and even the media is admitting, that the Fed made the f*** up of the century. The biggest mistake in financial history. And now the Fed, of course, to make up for the f*** up of the century, they want to clean the mess by pulling out the sledgehammer and crush those bonds. They've been buying bonds for years now. And guess what? They want to dump all of these bonds and get rid of them. Are they going to start to lose money on some of these bonds? Are they going to push yields out of whack? What about the mortgage-backed securities? Is the Fed about to lose money on that too? Nobody's paying attention to this, folks. And today we got more bad news for the Fed. We got macro data, unemployment data. The claims are now down to 166,000, the lowest level since 9. 1968. Why is this bad news, Maverick? Because good economic news means bad news for the stock market. Why? Because good news means that there is no need for the Fed's cocaine. As a matter of fact, the Fed should start tightening now. Now you might say, hey, what about all of that recession talk? We have the lowest unemployment in history since 1968. How could you have a recession when you got the lowest unemployment since 1968? And I say, go back to 1968 and Google what happened back then. And if that wasn't enough, even Jeremy Grantham came out today and said that the oil spike that you're seeing right now always, always preceded a recession. So again, look back, for example, at 2007, 2008, right before the Great Recession, the financial crisis of 09. We had some of the lowest unemployment levels at that time. We also had the highest oil prices at that time. What do you think we're having right now? The lowest unemployment since 1968 and the highest oil prices since 2007, 2008. On top of that, inflation continues to move higher and higher and higher with no stop in sight at all. Walmart is now offering $110,000 to new drivers. We're talking about truck drivers here. All of that inflation will be passed down to you and I, the consumer. When we talk about the Fed, guess what? Today, James Bullard, the bull Slayer turned out to be the bull's best friend because after his remarks, the stock market actually took off. So what did Bullard say? Bullard said that the Fed is behind the curve, okay, and he sees rates now at 3.5% by year's end. Now 3.5% if, let's say, brain dead said that, the stock market would have been rattled. But when Bullard says 3.5%, the expectations were for 4 or 5 from Bullard. But now he says 3.5%. The bulls like that. The Bullard turns out not to be so hawkish after all, at least for now. What the bulls also liked about Bullard's statement today is the fact that he said that yes, the policy is behind the curve, but it is making progress. And it is not too late for the Fed to do the soft landing. And this is what the bulls liked from Bullard today. The problem remains, every time you buy the dip and you push the stock market higher, just like Bill Dudley said yesterday, financial conditions are not being tightened. So the Fed will have to be more aggressive. In other words, if you're buying the dip right now, you're begging to be slaughtered. 
Anyhow, let's move on to the most alarming piece of macro data that we got today. And nobody's talking about it. Blackout by the media. Maybe they mentioned it here and there as, yeah, consumer credit, blah, who cares? Next, please. But this is, in my opinion, the most alarming piece of data that we got so far this year because what i've been talking about in this channel is the fact that the consumer is not that strong the myth of the so-called strong consumer the consumer is only strong because of the cocaine the stimmies and the free cash all over the place pumping stocks pumping tulips pumping farts in a jar but at the end of the day the consumer is absolutely zombified and stupid. Number one, they've been living beyond their means, taking rents and mortgages and car loans they, that they cannot really afford. Number two, they take their jobs for granted, as if these jobs are in the bag. They don't realize that they only got higher salaries and they got these jobs because we have a bubble in the economy, an artificial bubble that is about to be popped because the Fed created the bubble and now they have to clean the mess by crashing the bubble. Number three, Inflation is sky high, and the consumer is now chasing inflation. And I told you, the consumer is only strong because they keep swiping those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down, with no thinking at all that interest rates will rise higher. This setup could, keyword could, cause a depression in this economy. Because when the recession happens and they start to lose their jobs, they will be caught with their pants down. They got a mortgage they cannot afford. They got rents they cannot afford. They're behind in their utility bills. They owe thousands of dollars in credit card loans and debt, and the interest rates keep moving higher and higher and higher. This is a disaster scenario. And today, for all the doubters who've been saying, bro, you don't understand what you're talking about. You're stupid. Uh, trust Jerome Powell. The consumer is strong. Really? Today we got the data. U.S. consumer credit growth soars in February at the highest rate in 20 years. This is stunning, folks. And nobody's talking about it at all. Total consumer credit increased $41.8 billion in February, up sharply from a rise of $8.9 billion the prior month. Wow. From $8.9 billion to $41.8 billion, the Federal Reserve said Thursday. That translates into an 11 0.3% annual rate in February, up from 2.4% gain in the prior month. This is the highest rate since November of 2001. I wonder what happened back then. Economists had been expecting $15 billion gain, according to the Wall Street Journal forecast. What did we get? 40 1.8 billion. Not even close. Revolving credit, like credit cards, rose at 20.7% rate in February after 4% gain in the prior month. We went from 4% to 20.7%. This is a disaster, folks. The consumer is absolutely out of their minds, but on the other hand, what do they have to do? They have to chase all of that inflation higher. Rents are moving higher. Gas is moving higher. Groceries are moving higher. Utilities are moving higher. Diapers are moving higher. Do you now understand that this is a disaster scenario? And by the way, the reading for Marsh is going to be even uglier than this. We could get to $100 billion in consumer credit. We went from $8 billion almost in January to perhaps $100 billion by the end of Marsh. This is just alarming. You cannot even make this up. This was stunning even to me because it is beyond the worst case scenario. Next, let's talk about the stock pickers because course, they say that so far this year, stock pickers and hedge funds are having the worst performance in 20 years. Meaning, if you're a stock picker, you are holding massive bags. Matter of fact, the hedge funds, the hedgies, they're down on their shorts, so they're losing money on their shorts, and they're also losing money on their longs. What's going on here? These are the same hedgies, by the way, that you people trust with your money in your retirement, and you give them billions of dollars, and they gamble with the money, and they cannot even score anything, not on their longs, not on their shorts. They're losing both ways. And these people are a disgrace to stock pickers. I'm a stock picker, and I'm beating the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ combined, not by, you know, 1%, 2%, by a wide margin. We're talking about double digits. Why? Because I'm picking the right longs and I'm picking the right shorts. We talked about the shorts in details, shorting Zoom, shorting Moderna, DocuSign, Peloton, RKK, all of that garbage. And it worked out tremendously. When we talk about longs, for example, I shared this with you, and I keep talking about these names all the time. Not just this year, 
But last year, we're talking about names like Berkshire Hathaway, Freeport McMoran, Lockheed Martin, Mosaic, Alcoa, John Deere, Union Pacific, Chevron, the oil names, Hershey's, Indefensives, AbbVie in healthcare, Barrick Gold, Kroger. Guess what the year to date returns for these names are? Here we go Berkshire up almost 16%, Freeport up almost 16%, Lockheed 31%, Mosaic, look at this, 82%, John Deere 19%, Alcoa 44.5%. Hershey's 15%, Chevron 42%, Barrick Gold 31%. These are insane gains, folks. So when you say that stock pickers are losing, who are you talking about? Now, we got a problem with the transportation stocks, ZIM, for example, in Union Pacific. They were winners year to date. The problem is the crash, the recent crash in transportation stocks absolutely killed these two names. ZIM was up big year to date, so was Union Pacific, but we will talk about the crash in transportation stocks in details perhaps over the weekend. Here's another list that I shared with you before, the agricultural stocks, and I broke it down for you from fertilizers to seeding to herbicides to farming to processing to consuming, and I gave you names like Mosaic, Nutrin, ICL, FMC, Agco, ADM, Kroger. Look at the gains for these names. Unbelievable. So again, are stock pickers really that stupid or are the hedgies stupid? Here's another list, by the way, that I talked about not so long ago. We've been talking about the rise in natural gas. Names like Southwestern Energy, EQT, Cotera, Devon. Look at the gains year to date for these names. Here it is. We're talking about 40% certain cases, 70% certain cases. 60, 50%. These are insane gains year to date. Now, contrast this performance with the year to date performance of, say, Apple, Tesla, the meme stocks, the garbage stocks, the retail crowd, and the hedgies like. Not even close. We also talked about uranium, and I gave you two names UEC, URA, the ETF. I'm not a fan of ETFs, but in this case, you have my blessings to buy the ETF URA. The year to date for these names, UAC up almost 65%. We're talking year to date, folks, not five years gains. This is year to date. URA up almost 19.5%. And I've been talking about call for a while now, specifically the ticker BTC, which is for Peabody Energy. And we have recent tailwinds because the European Union decided to sanction Russian call, which is pushing call prices higher. It is absolute stupidity. The sanctions are firing back right away. And then the European Union says we failed to impose the sanctions due to technical issues. Oh really? I even tweeted about it today. I said BTU is a winner today. Thank you to the sanctions that continue to punish people at home with more inflation and reward Russia with more cash. Have you noticed that all of the assets that the Russians sell, be it oil, gas, coal, uranium, fertilizers, all of these assets are exploding in price, making the Russians richer. What a colossal of stupidity. But we can use this stupidity in our advantage and make gains like this. I tweeted about BTU today when the name was up 1.79%. The name closed the day with gains of over 8% and it continues to gain after hours. Tell me again which YouTuber out there puts cash in your pocket pretty much every single day. What? Crickets? Yep, that's right. And this channel has no gimmicks, no courses, no subscriptions, no farts in a jar. I'm just putting money in your pocket. And the beauty of all of this, I'm not even giving you tickers. I do once in a while, but I'm just teaching you how to fish every single day. And you do the job on your own. I pave the way for you, explaining the macro, explaining what's going on, and you do the job. And look at these year-to-date gains for these cold picks. BTUs up over 169%. Once again, folks, year to date, Contura Energy is up over 293% year to date. Likewise, Arc Resources up over 55% year to date. So when you shit on stock pickers and say, oh, they're a bunch of morons, they're losing money. Yeah, maybe the hedgies because they've always been stupid. They've been just lucky because the Fed made it so easy for everybody to look like a genius in the last 10 years or so. But now, when the market gets a little tough, we find out who was a scam artist, absolute clueless morons, pretending to be financial wizards, versus the actual stock pickers, the people who actually know what they're doing. And if you know what you're doing, if you're a stock picker, you're crushing the S&P and the NASDAQ here today. You just have to be in the right places in the stock market. And with that, folks, let's move on to cover the market information today. And we start with the performances of indices. And here we go.
The Dow Industrial Average was in the green by 87.6 points, or a gain of 0.25%. The Nasdaq barely in the green by 8.48 points, or a gain of 0.06%. The S&P 500 also in the green by 19.6 points, or a gain of 0.43%. The sector's performances were led by healthcare, capturing the gold medal at number 1, and at number 2 for the silver, energy, number 3 for the bronze, defensives. The laggards of the day are REITs, communication services, and financials. The market is so confusing right now. One day REITs were up, leading the gains. Now REITs are down, leading the losses. And then you have days where energy is down, and then energy comes back on top. You gotta be consistent here. You cannot just chase the move. Either you have conviction in your picks, or not. Moving on to the advanced to decline ratios, the NYSE 43% advancing versus 54% declining. The NASDAQ 36% advancing versus 59% declining. Commodities. It was a wild ride for crude. Crude was down big in the morning, yet it managed to close in the green by the end of the day. The WTI was up by almost three quarters of a percent. Brent was barely in the green so was gasoline, and then we have losses for heating oil, a little over one and a quarter percent. But the winner so far for the week is natural gas, scoring over six and a half percent gains today alone. What about softs? We have a rebound for lumber, not a big one, but almost one and a quarter percent. Then we have gains for OJ. The ride in OJ is absolutely impressive. OJ closing the day with gains of almost two and a quarter percent. Then we have gains for sugar, almost one and a half percent in the green. And cocoa, the rise of cocoa continues to go on with gains of a little over one percent. The laggards in softs led by cotton, cotton down almost one and three quarters of a percent. And then we have coffee also down by almost half a percentage point. Metals green across the board with exception of copper. Copper is the lagger today down almost half a percentage point. But we have modest gains for gold, silver, platinum, Platinum. The leader was Palladium, closing the day with gains of over 2.5%. Muted activities for meats across the board, live cattle, feeder cattle, lean hogs futures, nothing moving at all. When we talk about grains, wheat is down almost 1.5%, and we have muted activities for rough rice, corn, soybean meal, but decent gains for the rest. Soybeans, soybean oil, oats, canola, all closing the day with decent gains. Inflation is not going to stop, folks. Every dip in commodities will be bought until the Fed becomes serious by tackling inflation. Moving on to the options market, the big casino, leading the pack this time around, the hottest table by far is not Apple, it's actually Tesla, the souffle, with a little over 1 million contracts, but 59% of those were calls. Apple at number 2, not so far behind, but 950,000 contracts traded for the name today, about 59% of those were calls. AMD at number 3, with around 500,000 contracts traded today, about 66% of those were calls. And look at AMC, slow Slowly but surely, the options volume is picking up. Likewise, the implied volatility in AMC is also picking up higher. Not by a lot, but is this a sign that the apes are about to make a comeback? We'll see. And here are the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We start with the ticker XLU, the utilities ETF, a winner so far this week. And it has been for a few weeks, but somebody's calling a top here by buying the 68 puts for the expiration date, June 17th, with the expectations that the XLU could go down by more than 11% by then. They paid around 50 cents apiece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $875,000. What about the ticker DLTR, Dollar Tree? The buying calls big time, the 170 calls for the expiration date, June 17th, with expectations that Dollar Tree could move higher by more than 7% by then. They paid around five bucks and a half a piece to enter this trade, all in all spending around $6 million. What about the ticker S? CHW Charles Schwab They're buying puts here not a good sign by the way financials are about to report earnings and somebody's buying the 70 puts for the expiration date May 20th with the expectations that Charles Schwab could go down by more than 12 and a half percent by then they paid around one buck a piece to enter this trade all in all spending around one million dollars what about the ticker YANG Yang this is the inverse index for Chinese ETFs meaning if you're buying calls, you're betting that Chinese ETFs will go down. In this case, 
They're indeed buying calls, the 19 calls, with the expiration date of April 14th, meaning next week, with the expectations that Yang will surge higher by more than 22% by then. And again, a reminder, that means that Chinese equities will go down. And in this case, they paid around 25 cents apiece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $250,000. At the bottom of the table, what about the ticker STKL Sunopta? I used to own the name, and it has been my worst worst performer last year, down big, so I had to get rid of it for taxation's reasons. And for all of you who think that I'm the stock messiah, here's a reminder for you. I ate a massive bag in this one, STKL Sanapta. And somebody's betting for more pain to come for this name by buying the five bucks puts for the expiration date. June 17th, with the expectations that the name could go down by more than 7.5% by then, they paid around 50 cents apiece to enter. This trade, all in all, spending around $400,000. Moving on to the heat map analysis, it was uglier, in the morning at least, and then the pump came from Bullard. It doesn't look so bad, but we have a lot of pain in Chinese equities, Baba, GD, Baidu, all down big. And even the speculative names and software and the startups also down big. Financials, that is extremely alarming. Financials are down big, and look at this contrast, by the way. The 10-year yield moving higher, financials moving down. This is an interesting phenomenon, contrary to the trend, which is a correlation between the 10-year yield and the performance of financials. So what does that mean, by the way? It means that the yield curve is inverting, and it's hurting financials. Likewise, I'm really disturbed about the underperformance of autos. Ford down big. I own Ford. Not happy so far. The name is down big year to date. Honda also down. The Chinese names down, GM down, Toyota down. The only name that closed in the green is Tesla because they're buying call options. But again, the underperformance of autos is really disturbing. Something severely wrong going on here. Transportations crashed. Could autos be next? Think about it. We have a massive chip shortage. They're not going to be able to produce all of these cars. Number two, the EV hysteria. They canceled all of these gas combustion engines, all of these cars, they don't want them anymore. They want to concentrate 100% on EVs. And guess what? The prices of materials in EVs, the batteries, they're skyrocketing right now. So all of these cars will be overpriced. The consumer is not going to be able to buy them. Massive problem for the autos. On top of that, they got out of the Russian market. A stupid move specifically by Japanese manufacturers. And therefore, we're seeing a lot of pain in Toyota, Honda, and the rest of them. But the majority of the gains today came from healthcare, specifically diagnostics and big pharma once again. Look at the performance of AbV, Pfizer, up big today. And by the way, there is a new wave of the thing, so watch out for Moderna and Pfizer. And of course, Pfizer, all in all, is really cheap. Cheaper than healthcare, cheaper than the S&P 500, so you might want to buy Pfizer here. And we also have news for HP. Why? Because the big buffet, Warren Buffett, bought a 4.2 billion dollars stake in HP. Perhaps the big buffet thinks that this is a bargain, and it might be a bargain. Otherwise, why would he take a stake in HP? And guess who, by the way, last year recommended HP for you? Yep, once again, the guy you're listening to right now. And I think uh, I should print more, right? The printer is coming. Who knew that the real booster is actually the printer machine? Forget about boosters. Forget about Moderna. Forget about Pfizer. The real stock you want to YOLO right now is HP. And the ticker is HPQ, by the way, not HP. That's another company. And uh, it looks like they're already YOLOing HPQ. That was the leading indicator that the printer machine will be in demand once again. And here it is. Since then, HP is up around 16%. Now, you might think this is not impressive. How come the stock is not up 200%? Think about this. The majority of technology stocks are down big year to date. HP is an outlier. Moving on to the heat map for the ETFs. Muted across the board. No action whatsoever. Values outperforming growth by a tiny bit. The volatility indices, the VXX, UVXY were down. Healthcare, XLV led the pack. So was the XME materials. Energy here and there leading. But besides that, really boring action today. Even the international markets were boring. Besides China, down big. The majority of the action today was actually in commodities. Look at uranium, URA. Up big today, almost 6% in the green. Where are my uranium bulls?
Anybody in the comments, let me know. We also have gains for natural gas. Where are the natural gas bulls? UNG up over 5% today. So we're sticking with commodities, folks. We're not going to play any cute games here. Moving on to the charts analysis, and we start with SPY, the S&P 500. Let's do an hourly chart this time around. What's going on here? We knew from the get-go that the chart was oversold. So the expectations were for a rebound, at least a small one. And we got that today. The chart recaptured 446 and a half, and it got all the way to 451, and it did not make it all the way there. It did attempt to close the gap, but we ran out of time. So we cannot make a conclusion here one way or the other, because if the chart closed the gap and closed above 451, we could have said this is bullish, not bearish. But with this closing, below 451, who's to say that after all of these oversold conditions on the RSI worked out, we will see a flush down and the SPY would lose 443 once and for all. So for now, it is inconclusive, but the bears did significant damage and they rattled the confidence of bulls in this chart. The support for now, 446 and a half, the resistance, 451. And here's the daily chart for the SPY. Again, the bulls made some progress today by the fact that they kept 4,472 but if you look at the momentum indicators, it's tick tock. It's just a matter of time before we see a flush down. The volume moved a little higher on the buying side this time around. So mixed signals, it is a reaction of the drop. But the reaction is not so impressive so far. The bulls need to close the week decisively in the green. I'm not going to ask for 454, excuse me, 4,549 and a half. I'm just going to ask for the bulls to keep 4,472 to give them some credit here. But most importantly, when we look at the SPX, the cash index, what the bulls need to do by Friday, meaning tomorrow, is closing the week above the 200 days moving average. Now, we have a gap down in the SPX, and we know charts like to close gaps that they left on the upside. So who's to say that the SPX is not going to close the gap and then we'll take it from there. If the chart closes the gap tomorrow, it will be a win for the bulls because number one, you close the gap. Number two, you closed above the 200 days moving average. But the problem is what happens after that? Will the chart start to reverse and flush down again? Or will it give it another shot at 4,590? The behavior of the chart will be extremely important to watch. And here is the Q's, an hourly chart once again. The Q's is a lot weaker than the SPY because it didn't even close the gap or attempt to close the gap at around 360 today. It is still holding 352. This is the good news for the bulls. And we knew this will be an epic battle because the bulls built up a lot of defenses at around 352. The bears are not going to be able to break through that one easily. But for now, who has control over the chart? I would say the bears, because the bears smack the bulls like a Will Smith kind of smack right in the face. Oh, wow! A surprising one. The bulls thought they're in the clear. Nothing is going to stop them now. They're going to go back to all-time highs. And here comes the bear with the smack right in the face. Oh, wow. So I say the shock element alone gives the bears the advantage. The support for now is 352 the resistance at around 360. Here is a daily chart for the continuous contract for the NASDAQ. The good news once again for the bulls is 14,445 is intact as support, at least for now. The volume moved higher on the buying side. So the bulls are fighting back, folks. They're not giving up. The bulls are still here and they're fighting back. But the good news for bears is the following. The momentum indicators are curling down in negative divergences. It means that if the bulls don't make progress by tomorrow, a decisive progress, a big green candle to the upside, sooner or later, they're going to lose 14,445. And here is a 30-minute chart for the IWM, the Russell 2000. Yesterday, we talked about a bear flag formation. Today, the formation is playing out. It got us almost all the way down to 196.5, and then we saw a rebound in the IWM. The IWM was already oversold. It is still kind of oversold, so we could see an attempt to go all the way to 200, 202 specifically, but it doesn't look good here. I'd like to see 196 and a half retested, and if the bulls keep 196 and a half, then we're talking. Otherwise, I don't have a lot of confidence in this chart. What about the Dixie, the dollar index? It got to my target at around 99.9, .9. but what happens after that? We know that the Dixie is overextended, technically speaking, but it has been for a long time. The overextension in the technicals is not a reason to bet against the Dixie. We have to wait till the Dixie show us the reversal signal. By the way, a lot of you ask, what do I care about the Dixie? I'm not going to trade the dollar index. You trade commodities, you're genius. You trade gold, 
based on the dollar. For example, look at gold starting to move higher just by a tiny bit. But the resiliency is important, folks. The resiliency of gold is really impressive. And that tells me the moment you see a top in the dollar, a legitimate top, a reversal, understand that gold might start to take off immediately. Now we have mixed news. The Russian central bank says it will stop buying gold at a fixed price. What they're going to do instead is negotiate with commercial banks. They're going to buy gold at a negotiated price from commercial banks across the globe, those who are willing to do business with Russia to begin with. Is this good or bad for gold? I think it is immaterial for now. What matters is, is the Fed becoming too hawkish? Are we heading into stagflation and a recession? These factors are more important for gold than the Russian central bank. What about oil? Look at that, a failure all the way to 100 and now we're watching the epic battle of 100. If oil loses 100 for good, closing the week below 100, it's going to be an epic defeat for oil bulls. However, amidst all the pressure, the release from the SPR, the pumping of oil via fake news, if oil closes the week above 100 and specifically bounces higher significantly, for example, regaining 105.84, it will be a massive smack in the face, Will Smith kind, right in the face of the manipulators and oil bears. Moving on to the 10-year yield, the daily chart, what's going on here? It is on a breakout. It is overextended technically, but we cannot call a top. We don't have any reversal signal at all. What will cause a reversal signal? We have to have an update on the macro field. Are we about to get a piece of data tomorrow that could change the outlook of this chart? Not really. We have the CPI next week. That could change a lot of things. In the meantime, the weekly chart for the TLT, not looking good, folks. The bond bugs are getting crushed. A weekly closing below 128 will be a massive defeat for the TLT bugs. You got to work it out tomorrow and push this chart to close above 128. Moving on to the VIX, four hours chart. What's going on in VIX land? It has yet to make it above 24.29. The MACD indicator is curling down, about to cross and create negative impressions on the histogram, indicating the end of this pop. But it's not over yet. We have an epic battle tomorrow between the bulls and the bears. The bears will win if they close above 20. The requirement is 20. If they close above 24.29, that's a cherry on top. The bulls, on the other hand, must crush the VIX and close below 20. 20. We'll see who's going to win, but is what we're seeing right now a formation of a bull flag? Well, a closing above 20 for the week will keep that hope alive for VIX bulls. Moving on to the VXN, the VIX for the NASDAQ, what's going on here? Unlike the actual VIX, the MACD indicator is still moving higher. It is firming, indicating that we could see a pop in the VXN, we could see a drop in the Qs. For now, it is a bull flag formation until and unless the NASDAQ bulls manage to close this chart for the week below 27 and a half. What about Apple? Again, it is resilient. It is attempting to climb 172.4. There was a lot of talk about the gap that always these kind of charts close the gaps above. Even if that happens, who's to say we're not going to see a reversal and a loss of 172.4 support once again. And by the way, if that happens, it will be the ultimate shorting signal, the ultimate bearish signal. Moving on to Tesla, the Lane hourly chart. What's going on here? I'm about to confuse you, so buckle up your seat belts. We talked about a bear flag pattern that got us a little bit to the downside today, at least early in the morning. But we also have a gap above at around 1,090 and a half. The conditioning for now says that gap will be closed sooner or later. So this is what the bulls are betting for. This could be a double bottom formation that should take us all the way to close the gap. Here's the problem. In the larger picture, this is all in all a bear flag formation. So yes, the bulls could get their wish. They could close 1,090 and a half. They could close the gap. But then what happens? If the larger formation, the larger pattern plays out, and we see a flush down back to 995. It is the battle of the gaps. Which gap will be closed first? Is it going to be 1090 and a half or is it going to be 995? I say for now, we're closer to close the gap above at 1090 and a half. Tulips, BTC, what's going on here? That bull flag is melting fast, folks. 
you better conduct a rescue mission if you're a tulip bull as soon as possible by the way because the moment the chart loses 42,000 of support goodbye what about amc what's going on here let's start with the bearish outlook you look at the chart it lost 21 of support and the worst thing that happened today is another rejection from 21 on top of that this is a two hours chart by the way are we seeing a formation of a bear flag pattern that could take us down all the way to 14.24 support on the other hand on the apish side is what we're seeing right now an oversold condition in the rsi the macd indicators indicating that the apes could give it another shot at 21 before the end of the week something to think about we could see a rebound but it depends whether this chart is going to close the week above 21 or not a rejection at 21 once again not a good sign for the apes a closing for the week above 21 keeps the hope alive but perhaps we could see amc trading higher next week lastly moving on to the conclusion of this video what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow not a lot we have wholesale inventories and this will be a revision so the bulls have the all clear to rebound the market higher if they fail to do so you know that the bears have taken control over the indices and the broader market in general. An epic battle to watch, specifically the VIX, the 20, for the weekly closing. We'll see what happens, but this is all I got for you for now, folks. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. I will talk to you again over the weekend. I'm not going to make any promises that we're going to have a Friday video, but keep an open mind for pleasant surprises. Good night.